Hi everyone, good to see you here. I, um, I don't know if you guys watch my vlogs, but I'm very uncomfortable using the mic. How's everyone feeling? Uh, so, but yeah, so Paul to me is kind of like a Mr. Denon, so it's a, it's a real pleasure to have him uh, introduce me. Um, it actually all started one year ago here at ADE. I uh, just did a panel and usually when the panel finishes, I'll, I'll talk to uh, people and there was like a huge line of people trying to talk to me and give them advice about demos and whatnot. And there was Paul pulling my t-shirt and he was like, can you, come, can you come? And I'm like, well, I'm kind of like in the middle and he's like, he's just dragging me. And he says, we have it right here. So I um, met Paul at Creamfields Festival, which was uh, at the end of August. And he said, are you interested in looking at a CDJ player we've been developing. I work for Denon now, we just in, uh, he uh, interviewed me for a magazine and um, he said, I have sketches here of this new CDJ player. And I'm like, well, you know, I'm good. Like, I am not really interested. And he's like, you have to see it. So he showed me uh, these sketches of these uh, UFO-like uh, instruments and it looked very interesting. And actually what Paul had to say was, everything I wanted to hear that I was missing on the current CDJs. And I was like, okay. So it, it caught my eye. And so fast forward to that uh, Amsterdam dance event. Uh, he pulled me out of the crowd and he said, we have them in a hotel room. Do you want to feel them? I was like, heck yeah, I want to feel them. So, uh, so yeah, like a, like a good little groupie, he dragged me to uh, his hotel room. And uh, the players were there, laid out. Uh, yeah, even the mixer was there, right, Paul? Yeah. yeah, even the mixer. And so I got to touch them, I got to feel them, I got to swipe the amazing touch screen. It was like as if my, I had like my phone on my CDJ and I was like, whoa, what's this? And all these pads, I was like, are these all hot cues? Yes, they were. So I was uh, instantly convinced and um, I told them like, Paul, you know, I really like you. I know I'm in your hotel room and everything, but uh, you guys need to send me the finishing, the finished product. I will test them for two weeks, three weeks, and then I'll let you guys know because obviously this is a big deal. I have all these videos up on YouTube where I'm promoting this other brand for years, and now you guys want me to switch? And so a lot of people instantly say, oh, it was the money. Then it came to you with a truckload of money and, uh, you know, Obviously, you, you'll switch. So there was no money talk whatsoever, nothing. And I got to test the product and I didn't need two weeks. Actually, it was more like four days until I thought, wow, these things are the future. Like the, the difference for me was like the feeling um, of having an iPhone 3 and then switching on to an iPhone 7. And I was like, this just makes sense. This, this is all that I wanted in a CDJ. And um, so, yeah, instantly convinced. I had to be a little bit patient when it came to the mixer because uh, they needed some redeveloping. Um, but I was instantly in love with them. And uh, the transitioning has been very seamless. Uh, basically, the, the things sit where they need to sit on a CDJ. It's not, it's not that much of a difference. So transitioning was, uh, was very smoothly. I remember I had this uh, dance fair talk where I, where I first spoke about these things in public, where I was a little bit nervous because, you know, within mixing and within, I guess, talking to a crowd as well, um, gets a little bit nerve-wracking to, to be on a new setup and to, to try new things out. So. I was barely able to make that, but now I have a little bit more, kind of like, you know, uh, when I DJ, I DJ on the fly, I DJ on the millisecond, so now I've developed a, a reflex for like certain buttons, where they are, where they sit, and uh, I must say, like, with the latest update of Denon, well, shout out to Denon for the latest update, I don't know if you guys see it, but the Hall Echo has the double L's. So that's awesome. This is uh, my favorite uh, effects as well, and uh, I'll, I'll uh, show it to you uh, a little bit later on. I, can you see the DK numbers there or no? 
It's a little bit small, right? But I'm, I'm tweaking the decay of the, of the Hall echo and it goes up until infinity. Let me just pull up a kick drum here because that's amazing. So the last couple of weekends I've uh, finished my shows like this. Hang on. So this is a reverb that's set to infinity. And so with the, with the low and high FX uh, frequency cue, I can... So that's a, that's a cool little thing. Um, yeah, so there's a, there's a ton of things I can explain from here on, but I actually want to do this very much as an interaction with you. I can imagine you guys have uh, questions about technique, about mixing techniques, or about buttons. Or, um, so feel free to, to give, give me a guideline here. It's as if you know I'm DJing and I am watching the crowd to, to see what you want. So if anyone wants to see something or is interested in, in hearing something, stick up your hand and I'll answer the question. Yes? Yeah. So the, the former CDJs, uh, for a long time, they were the cutting edge of technology. But just a, just a very simple thing, the way we swipe our phones every single day, this screen does exactly that. Yet the old CDJs have like this old technology and w whenever I, you know, I uh, had a half a year ago, I, I switched back to one just to feel it. And it's just so weird now, it's just like a fake touch screen. So that's number one. But the processor power is, uh, is humongous in, in these players. And so for instance, uh, a big feature of the Denons is not the emergency loop, but they have the emergency track. So when you accidentally pull out the USB while the track is playing, you still have all the full uh, capability of the track. And th this has to do with processor power. Well, now one of the features as well, um, and it's so interesting because uh, obviously on the, the DJ controllers, they've had it for ages, like the layers. So one player is actually two players, layer A and layer B. But that, that uh, so this is, you don't need a laptop for this. So this is inside of the player, which, yeah, shows how powerful it is. That's it. Okay, we're done. Any more questions? Luke, can I throw one in from the side just to elaborate a bit more on the dual layer functionality? You, you're very much setting the new style of previously with CDJs, it would have been like artists would have had four units. Your configuration is one on the left, two on the right of the mixer. The one on the left is your dual layer one, and the two on yeah. the right are your single layers. Uh, do, you, do you quite often deploy the dual layer in that setup? Um, well, to be honest, mixing in dual layer, dual layer is so scary. It's just so scary. So I made a vlog about this, and this was mainly because it was a practice for myself to get used to the dual layers. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's the one, one deck mix vlog I made. But uh, yeah, some, sometimes, like occasionally, I'll, uh, I'll set up like an acapella on the, on the second layer. And so I, my layout is three CDJs, and then uh, player one has layer A and layer B on there. So obviously you only have uh, four mixing channels. So technically I could do a four deck mix uh, with, uh, with two players. But I prefer having three because I, think st I still think it's a little bit scary using the dual layer. It's just one button of a way of like pressing pause on the wrong song. Yeah, yeah. so we came, uh, so th this was Afrojack's birthday party and uh, we came there and they said they only had room in the DJ booth for one player and they didn't really want to move Afrojack's setup because it was his birthday or whatever. It, w it wasn't, wasn't possible. So in the end, we stuck to one, one player 
in one mixer and I was like, screw it, let's, let's do it. I mean, I, I can do this, no problem. So um, yeah, there I used the, the dual layer function and it, it comes in really handy. For instance, um, at Creamfields, we had one uh, player that uh, didn't have its day, that probably had a hangover or something and it needed to be swapped out uh, during my set. And so yeah, then the dual layer becomes very handy to, to have like one player swapped out and uh, yeah, so it does come in handy at times. But I wouldn't recommend being drunk and playing a dual layered set because it's really like, okay, which track is playing where right now? And um, yeah, only if you, <laughs> if you keep on thinking straight, then, uh, then that really works. I have one here. Uh, are you also satisfied with the engine software? And the preparation software? Yeah. There are some developments I am trying to push right now, and so there, there hasn't been an update uh, from version 1 for a while. And I, actually, I was speaking to the guys of uh, Denon uh, last week, and there's a new update on the way where, where... So I do this almost weekly. I, after the weekend, I give my feedback, and, um, and it's so incredible how fast the guys are. So whenever there's a new update, well, I, I have never seen anything like this where they take my feedback that seriously. It's implemented in the next update. So, uh, and all of us, Tiesto and Oliver Heldens, all of them have features in these players. We, we learn from playing at festivals and playing at clubs. So it's really, um, well, the, the, all the developments pretty much of the last year has been with our involvement and, and the features that are on there. Yeah. Yes. Look, can you uh, maybe give a small demo of how it works with using the different layers? Yeah. Let me uh, let me grab my headphones because I don't have my pre pre, pre mixed set uh, with me. <laughs> yeah, I can use the mic now. Oh boy, you guys are gonna have me. Uh, work here. Which track to stop right now? Which one is playing? So track B is playing, the blue one. So this one I can press stop now. So I'll, I'll search for a new track here. Mike, Mike, Mike. So, yeah, it does get confusing, especially every time you finish the mix, you gotta ask yourself, which track is playing? And I guess, and I, I really only just like saw this. Now I guess this right here is the corner to watch. 
obviously, obviously you have this one, you know, the green is the deck A and the blue is deck B, but somehow it doesn't compute with me yet. And especially when you mix out, then I guess the white one is always good and the green is always the one that's playing. So that really needs to marinate still. But yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's the way. So, yeah. Luke, one more question. Yeah. Well, what's your secret in uh, using only the pitch and syncing uh, the beats? Because it's really amazing to see. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> well, uh, my secret is being very old. Yes. <laughs> and um, I've, been, I've been DJing for, yeah, over 20 years now. And I started with vinyl. And when we used to mix with vinyl, this was when the dinosaurs still walked. Um, whenever there were tracks with strings or pianos, and I would hear a DJ mix, and the, the string or piano would go like, yeah, uh, like you had like, uh, and, it, and then the sound went like, yeah. Uh. I was like, nah, man, come on, you can, you can be cleaner than that. So uh, I saw Miss Monica mixing like this because because she was playing a track with strings and the beat went off and I was like wait I don't hear anything and it's still in beat and so I started watching what she did and she was handling the pitch always now mind you it took me a good one and a half to two years to to perfect that technique but up until now you know now I don't even need to think what my hand is doing it, it's kind of like my brain hears the beat go off and my hand does that, so it literally comes in handy. Um, yeah, so it's just a clean thing. So obviously nowadays you don't need to do it. There are occasions where I'm like, oh, it's 128.2, okay, so 128.2. And then if I have a real lazy day, I'll just, uh, so I do mix with uh, like the, what is this in Denon uh, language called, uh, Paul, the key? Lock. Key lock, yeah. Mixing with the key lock on, so if you mix with the key lock on, you can push whatever you want, you won't hear the, hear it, but I, I actually do prefer, it's just a, like a natural feel to sometimes be just offbeat and then have it and then it just becomes very organic. Two, let's get the one in the back first. Okay. Um, it uses time to calculate, but the most important thing over there is using a USB with a, like a very big write, uh, read and write speed. So my USB is 150 read and write, and anything under that becomes really slow, I must say. So with playing as well and loading, obviously there's a lot of data going on, and it's just... Um, there's a function in uh, Engine that says uh, to optimize your library. I, I do that nowadays whenever I put tracks on there and it keeps it all very smooth. And if you don't do that, there, there's going to be uh, corruption and, uh, and, and that sort of thing. Okay. Great. Yeah, you. Yeah, just a question. Um, Dan and DJ also has great headphones and I also see you using the, the in-ears. Is there a specific reason not to have any headphones with the go for the in-ear? Good question. So this, um, this actually came from me getting kids. This was back in 2001, my, my baby boy got born and I remember I couldn't blast any music in the studio anymore. So what I thought was a really good solution was that in my amp I would put like a regular set of headphones and then under it I put like one, uh, like one ear pod type of thing and put it in the mixer. So this was my, uh, my pre-listen and this was my uh, club room or something. Stereo sound. Stereo sound. And, and so at home I could blast it as loud as I could and could still mix and everything. So then at a certain point I thought, okay, so why can't I do this in the club? So I went to the club with just the one little earpiece and it worked. So that was great. And at a certain point, um, <laughs> I started looking at mixing with in-ears. 
So because I was mixing with the one already, I figured, you know, maybe I could have, because a lot of the times the DJ monitors suck. So I remember doing a couple of shows in a week and I had these, this wall of, uh, I always call shoe boxes next to me, the DJ monitors. And it was, bl it was like a wall of sound, but I couldn't hear any detail. It was like some, someone uh, from the government came and measured my uh, dBs and I was at the pain boundary of sound and I was still like, I can't hear it. And so I just needed more detail in my sound and someone suggested me to start mixing with inners uh, because people in bands, you know, when they perform, they have uh, the perfect sound in their ears. So I started doing that, but I still needed that little, little setup. And so I uh, had my dad make like a, a mini mixer because this, the split on uh, the previous DJ mixer was always on the left side. And I can't pre-listen left side. Somehow my, wire, my brain is not wired like that, so I, I need to have it here. So we developed this little mixer, and in my in-ears I had the same system as, as I had in my living room with my, with my baby boy, where I would press on the cue and, and the sound would pop up in my right ear. And so a month ago, it was only a month ago, I reached out to Dan and I was like, this split, I could totally use this split. But the split is on the left, and but hang on, I can just send an email now. <laughs> so I sent them an email, like, hey guys, can we have the split on the right? They were like, yeah, of course. So now the split is on the right as well. I don't need to bring my little mini mixer, and, and there it is. So the reason um, is that if I would be mixing, I can, number one, have the sound really low because they, they damp. Number two, if I move my head, the sound is always the same because it's in my ears. And if I would obviously not uh, be mixing in Bar Broker because the, it's like a small club, but f for instance in like a big warehouse with like a reverbs going on everywhere, I would still have the same sound inside of my ear. So this makes for tight mixing, always. Well, you get one more question, so yeah, then you, then you need to pay for it. <laughs> no, it's okay, don't worry. <laughs> Uh, because nobody else is asking questions. Yeah. So no, go I'll ahead. Take my chance. Yeah. Uh, look, you are uh, a DJ who is always up front when it comes to new technologies and adapting fast. What do you think is going to be uh, the next uh, couple of years the biggest revolution when it comes to DJing? And how do you think the future of DJing is going to look like? Well, I can tell you that uh, Denon, for instance, it seems that Denon is one step ahead and it's like cool, right? Yeah, awesome, one step ahead. They're not, they're three or four steps ahead and they're already thinking of incredible solutions that will come. I, I heard a couple of things and it really blew my mind. And uh, yeah, so I know what's coming up. I can't tell you guys just yet, but it is very much in development and I will be a part of that. So I'm very happy. Uh, obviously, uh, I just did the vlog with Afrojack about the pre-recorded sets and everything. And he mentioned that it's, you know, it's going to be next level DJing or, well, DJing, uh, next level performance uh, things coming up. And I, I do believe that. It's an it's a ever-changing thing. So, you know, that's why I specifically say that I'm a dinosaur when it comes to the, the art of DJing. I love the old art of DJing, but um, there are going to be many developments. Uh, so, for instance, uh, the whole DJ controller thing when... Um, when a lot of the talent that's coming up right now uh, mixes on DJ controllers and the features on those are incredible. If I would come up right now uh, mixing on a DJ controller, I would be so happy because for a small amount of money you can have all the features you have in here. Only thing you need to do is bring your laptop to the club and I'm not a fan of that with all the drunk people and all the beer and all the booze and sweaty ceilings and everything. But uh, but yeah, there's a lot on the way. There's going to be a lot of developments. Yes. Yes, you. What, what about, um, I believe that there's also the drum pads mm -hmm. kind of uh, feature on the, on, the, on the Denim DJ. Do you make use of these as well? Because they don't have them on the Pioneer, of course. Yeah, 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 I do. I, and actually, I need to do that more. I, uh, so I... I keep on talking about my vlogs, but I did a vlog about with a DJ controller as well, the the Denon MC7000, 
and the padding on those is incredible. And I just remember, but so I am, um, this is my prep for my set, so I, uh, I will always set a cue point on the first break, and then the climax, and then the drop, and then possibly the, the end section, the mix. So whenever I want it, I can go back to those. But what I did on the pads on the DJ controller was this. So you can uh, you can get as creative as you want with them, and it's they feel nice. They're like rubbery, and uh, yeah, there's a bit of padding going on for sure. Yes. There are also a lot more uh, effects on the on, on the eight pads. Do you use them at all? Um, well, the the go-to uh, effect for me is the roll, <laughs> which I love, which is just so very. Um, don't really need to think about it. Like so, if you go into the slicer mode. Let me pick another track, guys. I'm gonna pick a track by Crosses. Crosses is in the building! Right there, two guys, hands up. Make some fucking noise. Okay. <laughs> and, um, so yeah, there are, let me just slice up a bit. And actually, Paul is really good at slicing. He's way better at slicing than I am, but. So there's two slicer modes. The, 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 well, the thing that bugs me about this is that you actually need to use two hands. So I'm going to show you the roll, which you only need one hand for, and then the other one you can, you can point to the roof. Um, but the, the blue slicer uh, means you, you get to slice the, the part of the track that's playing. So it goes like this, on with the track. And then the green slicer is, it'll put it in a loop. Put, it will put that section in a loop. So I'd, I'd prefer to have the green one. But the roll uh, sounds very similar, uh, but it's just one hand. And, and when you put the slip function on, it, it becomes out of this world, so. So yeah, that, uh, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. A couple of things, if you ever, uh, if you're ever, ever in a chance to try these out, or if you ever end up on stage, and I was just playing with uh, with Mina, our uh, semi mix mash uh, MC vocalist who, who DJs as well, and it was her first time playing on a set like this, and she just simply wanted to to use the cue button. So with the other CDJs, that's very easy. You would press the in and then the Q would be there. On here, it's different. So if you, in this case, if you want to use the Q, it's a shift and Q. Otherwise, if you would press Q, uh, so usually it's a programmed at the beginning of a track. So you would be playing the track and you would think, oh, okay, I need to press the Q and you're back at the beginning of the track. So you can reprogram it, it by using shift. So in Denon world, we have a lot of shift going on. For instance, if I want to have the, the pitch change from plus 20 to plus 100, it's a shift and it's plus. And back to 10 or 20 or where, wherever. So those things are a little bit different uh, than uh, what most are used to. Guy with the glasses at the bar, drinking nothing. Not, nothing yet. <laughs> um, how about the real-time analysis? I know it's on there, but did you take that into use during live set or with back-to-back -back sessions? How it works for you? 
Um, yeah, so I, because I do come prepared uh, like that. So I use uh, the engine and it usually analyzes like that. But the real-time analysis is, is rather fast. Yeah, it, it is quite fast. Uh, faster than what you guys are used to. Yeah. More hands, I saw more hands, no? Yeah, you again? Yeah, of course. Uh, what about the, the new loop kind of uh, button, right? It's, um, yeah. Which Pioneer is kind of like pushing and I was, uh, it's a twist? Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit of a twist. We are still uh, working on a couple of features. So, but I do think, <laughs> here we go. This is a good development. So right now you cannot end your set by doing it's not possible. I mean, it, it kind of is, but... But it doesn't go as seamless, so you cannot, like, uh, do this and then the loop goes, you know, longer or shorter. But what I like about uh, the loop function on here is that you can, you can actually shift the loop as well. So I can shift... And I can go... So it's, yeah, it's a little bit different, but I am curious to see how a lot of guys will finish now. Maybe just, uh, you know, say goodbye on the mic or something. I'm sure you'd love to know a little bit more about how Luke manages the crazy lifestyle that he has. We, we were chatting about this earlier. I'm sure the guys in the audience Luke, would love to hear how you manage being a kung fu athlete, a dedicated dad, a DJ, a record producer, and an entrepreneur. How do you do it? Yeah, so uh, I often get this question, and so one of my answers is I live a very extremely boring life where everything is planned out, so everything has its sections. Uh, every m month I plan out my daddy days, I plan out my travels, and it's really per month, so I'll know exactly where I'll need to be three weeks from now. And uh, so there's not much room for improvisation. Um, Netflixing and chill, so today I, I had a question, what do I like more, Game of Thrones or Breaking Bad? And I was like, I haven't watched any of those. So that saves a lot of time. And so, yeah, sorry. So within, within, uh, so, wait, so how long is the episode of Breaking Bad? 30 minutes? Game of Thrones. An hour. An hour? That's crazy. Shit. So in an hour, usually I do my workouts in 45 minutes. So that means instead of watching a show, I can work on my fitness, and that's what I do. Or, and then if it's if you if you binge watch all of those, man, that's awesome. I like it's awesome entertainment. But you could have also done something productive, like make a new track, or make two, or figure out what you want with your life, or you know. the The thing is. And I do, fe I do feel that a lot of entertainment, obviously I'm responsible for entertainment as well within my vlogs, but I do feel that entertainment industry, there's a bunch of documentaries about this as well, um, is used to keep a lot of people from their ambition. Where it's like, oh, let's just have them like watch TV and not think too much of how we can improve the world or not think too much of, you know, how, what can I do to better my career? What, what do I have as goals in my life? Oh, yeah, I want to be, I know, I need to watch my diet or something. But, you know, I'm just going to watch all seven seasons of Game of Thrones first. Um, that sort of thing, you know. Give yourself some time to, to think where you can improve, where you can better your time management and... And figure yourself out a little bit. A lot of people are unhappy and they don't know why. Maybe it's because they're watching Game of Thrones too much. <laughs> or, you know, that sort of thing. So I never do that. I maximize my time. And even if I uh, wait for rendering my vlog, for instance, I'll answer a few tweets. And there's always time to do, like, 
So for instance, I take over 200 flights a year. While waiting at the airport for your flight, uh, you're at the gate, your flight boards in 20 minutes. That's a perfect moment for, to get my laptop out and do some color correction on my vlog. So then I get to my seat and there's another 30 minutes uh, before you need to close your laptop down. I'm having my laptop out again. And so I'm always maximizing time and so that's why I can do so much. Uh, yeah, that's, that's my key, I guess. Yes? So how, how do you relax? Well, relaxing is... What is relaxing? What is relaxing? See, because if, if I go and lay on a sunbed at a pool somewhere, I get antsy as F. You know, it's like, oh, man, I need to do this, I need to do that, and that needs to be... Um, so I meditate sometimes. I'll take 10 minutes to meditate, which, which is nice. But most of my relaxing is just being happy in, in doing what I do. And I feel that happiness is, is, is a big clue of, of people's relaxation. Obviously, you're happy when you're relaxing because you're not at work. Or obviously, you're happy watching, binge watching all these shows because you're not doing work for someone else. And so I have the luxury I work for my own. And everything I do is fun. And so I don't need that much of, you know, chill out time. So I occasionally have times every, it's like a, a day in every one and a half month that I'm like, okay, no, so okay, I can't right now, you know. And then I'll just crash on the couch and do a half hour of uh, watching some seven minute vlogs or something. Uh, but other than that, yeah. Happiness. Someone asked me today uh, in an interview, so what do you think is the definition of success? And I told them it's realizing your goals and being happy about them. So if you would have a goal today, which would be eating a croissant at the end of the day or eating pizza or whatever, then when the pizza is over, you get the pizza and the pizza is over, you, this was a successful day. That could be a goal. You know, goals don't need to be that high, or if it would be your goal to watch at least two seasons of Game of Thrones today, and you finish the day watching both, and you're happy about it, then you have success. So happiness and uh, achieving your goals is real success.